Nowadays, it's hard pressed to find a person who hasn't been to a brewery or tried craft beer. But that wasn't the case 10 years ago. Today, we talked to Eric Johnson, the head brewmaster and founder of Wild Heaven Brewery, about the beginning trends of the industry, the current trends, where it's going to go, and how to stay afloat in an industry that is now contracting. All that and more today on the Marketing Mad Men podcast. They say marketing is a madman's game. So now we turn it over to the Marketing Mad Men with Nick Constantino and Trip Joe. Hey, welcome to the Marketing Mad Men. Nick Constantino here, and today we have a special guest and a co-host. Uh, the co-host was a last-minute addition, so I am not speaking or vouching for yeah, him. Yeah, feel great. But he is here. <laughs> welcome, Tyler Nelson, whose relevance to the beer industry, which is our topic today, is we actually poached him and plucked him away from Green Flash. Um, so what relevance yeah. that means, I don't know, but he was the best <laughs> we can get. I also have here to counter for Tyler's probable ineptitude is, <laughs> is, Certain Eric, ineptitude. is Eric Johnson, <laughs> um, co-founder and brewmaster of Wild Heaven, um, who we've had as a company has done some collaboration stuff with. Uh, I'm sure you a lot of... A lot of you people out there know of them, know the beer, know the craft beer industry, but we're going to get into the weeds here and talk about some fun stuff. Um, so welcome, guys. Hey, yeah, thanks. Good to be here. So, Eric, uh, you have a odd resume. I'm going to just throw it out there. It's all over the place. Uh, horticulturist, biologist, brewmaster, bar owner, all sounds like fun things, but not things well, that align mi- Microbiologist, well. right, Eric? Microbiologist. Yeah, and, and horticulturalist. And horticulturalist, yeah. both, yes. So- Talk a little bit about your upbringing, what you got to do to do all those diverse things, and then we'll bring it back in the next segment and start talking about Wild Heaven. Yeah, I mean, I was I was raised by an avid gardener. My dad had five kids and was dirt poor, and so he grew most of the food that we ate. And uh, I was the only one of any of the kids that actually enjoyed the gardening um, process. Started homebrewing when I was like 17. Got it. And so they were kind of parallel paths, and there's a lot of overlap um, between what we're doing in fermentation and sure. beer making, um, there's a lot of chemistry involved in it. Uh, and so with as, with as disparate as those two paths seem, um, they are quite elegantly related to each other. And so it, it you know, the, the one is definitely, um, you know, helped me succeed with the other. For sure. And we'll get into that probably about the hops and the strains. And I mean, sure. I know, you know, those hops, brews of hops and yeast are passed on from generations and like the most sacred part of a brewery. So we'll get to that. But talk a little bit quickly about horticulture and what, what it actually is and what you would be studying, because I think people just think plants and that's the end of it. Talk about what the actual coursework is like and, and how that could have led you to getting into microbrewing and all that stuff. Yeah, so my emphasis in horticulture was was in propagation physiology. So I was I was working dun, with, dun, dun, yeah, which I can't even spell. So yeah, 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 that's great. So propagation uh, physiology. Yeah, so we were we were I, I worked for almost a decade cloning plants. Yep. And so if if you were to encounter a tree in the wild that you really really loved, um, you can take a little cutting, yep. like tip cutting from it, and with the right hormone regimen in the right environment, um, it will root. And then that is an actual genetic clone of that tree. And so in the industry, whenever you see a tree that's named or a plant that's named, say like October Glory Red Maple, well, those are all clones. Cabernet Sauvignon is a clone. Sauvignon Blanc is a clone. Those are all cultivar names. Um, And he's already trying to cross over into... into, There there you go. go. Well, (laughs) well, I mean, and and I like it. And and the reason I say I like it is because when you talk about plants and and how things grow, uh, we always talk about cutting everything down and burning everything to the ground, not how we duplicate it and make it. And I think that there is more, call it the craft beer movement and the micro distillery movement and the farm to table movement, but there is more focus on going back to old methods of making things and eating things that have rooted themselves. And I think if you look at it from a biological standpoint probably a good thing for society to start thinking about hey how do we save some of these things and go back to those so that's why personally i I I think personally that one of the things that i think goes along with the you said farm to table for want of a better term or the craft beer movement or craft cocktails and craft distilling is i think that part of why it's uh, it's grown is people it's part of it it's an experience you're experiencing something along with just consuming it right you're not just buying and it's and eating or buying and yep. drinking it's there's a whole there, it's not just a story or it's marketed to me well it's part of a process of how it's made and you're more involved with the process if there is a process versus yeah. I agree. I agree. The experiential, the, exper- the experiential part is huge. But I also say, like, I gr- I grow my own tomatoes and peppers, and like making your own tomatoes and biting into a tomato you made is unlike anywhere you're going to get. Absolutely. It, no matter how it is, no, like, no. making your own. I had, you know, it's fall, and it's probably my- not easier or cheaper than just going and buying a tomato. Not anymore, but that's the problem because yeah. it's so cheap. It's so it is so commoditized now, and it's so part of the bureaucracy and the chain that how could you be eating anything good? Like I did. It's it's pepper season, so like my trees, sure. I'm trimming everything back, and I cut. 
150 peppers. What am I going to do with 150 peppers? <laughs> so I sat there literally like with goggles on and I'm making hot sauce for myself. And of course I'm flavoring you are. hot. Of course you are. Like whatever. But I was about to say, get a big pot and make it. you get it right, it's not about making a recipe. It's just, oh my goodness, I made my own hot sauce. You all love yeah. it. I'm going to throw half of it out. You know, I'll freeze half of it. But it's an amazing feeling. So I agree with you. It's experiential. But it is also, these were, these have been, these processes of making food and drink and mead and all are thousands of years old. Oh, yeah. The advent of making it with with chemicals and is, is new. So obviously it's better the old way, a family cooking for themselves. Those things were part of society for thousands of years. So what I ask you is, do you see the movement continuing right now? Do you see that being part of um, society? And, and do you think that that's a good thing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, that we have in our industry simultaneously two different things are happening. There is there is a movement away from old world brewing okay. um, among some of the, the younger brewers that – um, where it's very emotionally important to them to invent new styles, and, and that's the way that they see their pathway to putting their fingerprint. And that's probably because you're at a saturation point. There's so much of it. You feel like you have to do something so different to be to be known, to be, to be right. seen. Right, right. And I, I would say with, with the veteran brewers, there is a resistance to that and, and a move back in the direction of old world brewing. Those, those beers... Um, really, really value, um, you know, excellence and clarity and, you know, the quality of the ingredients. We're not just trying to make something with pounds and pounds of lactose and Skittles and candy bars and, yeah. <laughs> you know, the diabetes stouts and the yogurt vomit IPAs yeah, yeah. and all the stuff that's just kind of silly. You know, yeah. it's uh, for us. I, I think that there's an elegance in just a beautiful, clean, crisp German Pilsner. That style is way the f- harder to make yeah. than your yeah. diabetes stout. Yeah, Eric, I've always harder. said, and I, I've, yeah. Nick's heard me say this several times too, if, if there is one beer I will always order first when I walk into a brewery for the first time, it's a Pilsner if they have one. Yeah. Absolutely. because it's what For a microbrewery, because just the color craft of brewing, it. Craft brewing. Say, brewing nobody says microbrewing. Because the color of it, just, just well, it's, it's, so it's all the impurities it, are seen, the lighter the color. It's what Eric just said. Well, it's it's a lot harder to make a Pilsner than it is an IPA. It's, I mean, it's, it's one of the hardest styles. In fact, if you walk into a brewery well. and you're and you're uncertain as to whether or not they know how to, whether or not they're good at making yeah. beer, you always order the smallest thing they make. So order that Pilsner. If it's garbage, don't drink yeah. anything yeah. else they have on top. <laughs> Which is the po- exactly my point. Yeah, so if they can do a Pilsner well, they can brew. My, That's right. My roommate, That's right. my roommate that I lived in D.C. with, that worked for Sam Adams, he, we, we, we made a beer together. And, like, he was the meticulous – because you have to be. Like, if one thing gets in the, the stills and they're oh, yeah. wrong – so he was a meticulous one, but I was the, the chef. And I was like, all right, this is what we're going to do. On the secondary fermenter, we took a bottle of wood for a double, double roasted barrel. And then we took wood chips and we soaked them and we put them mm-hmm. in the secondary fermenter – Sure. To make this beer, okay, yeah. it was delicious. Right when you drank one, if you drank more than oh, one, yeah. the f- it started being a little bit like, oh, I don't know if this is how beer is supposed to. Be. But it was, it was good. But, <laughs> but again, I, I, you know, I think restaurants are similar. You see two people going one way, all this gastro, all this crazy stuff, this gastrochemistry, and then people are like, how about an open wood fire and a hearth? So I think that divide is going to continue to go. Personally, I hope it goes more back to the old world traditions. Um, but but we shall see. So let's let's fast forward a little. Let's go. You, uh, so you went to school in Athens. Uh, you right. opened a bar. So that it, all that horticulture probably went to good use there. So yeah, talk a little totally. bit about that. Yeah. So I was I was in um, I was the director of horticulture for for three big horticultural companies. Um, at that point in time, it was Wayside Gardens, uh, Park Seed, and Jackson Perkins. Okay. They were huge. We we were to catalog plants what Victoria's Secrets is to underwear. And so it was like, that is com- wait, hold on. certainly what? an image. I don't know. How, uh, that is certainly Stop an image. there and re- explain that. that just so everybody knows, this is why it's called theater of the mind. We were, we were to hold a court, to hold a horticulture. What Each Victoria of you should have your own Andre. image. Each of you should have your own image of what that yeah, looks yeah. like. That's right. Think about that now. Let's keep actually going. just pick poison. Not pictured there poison ivy from well, Batman. So there's a little bit of both there. So yeah, we, so we were we were one of the largest catalog companies uh, in the U.S. Victoria is is the largest. Um, and oh, so in the way yeah. that they dominated that category, that sure. was our space. And, um, you know, I was traveling all over the world buying, you know, tulips in, in Holland and, you know, dealing with plant breeders in Belgium, whatever. And so I got to experience all of these amazing pubs because, of course, that's what you do when of you're course. over there. Of course. Um, and, and so I, I opened up Trappy's Pub in Athens mainly just as a hobby because the, it, it's not that there weren't some okay – bars in Athens, but there wasn't anything that was really, really exploring all these different esoteric beers yeah. that had very recently been become legal in Georgia. So up until 
you know, before July 4th, 2004, anything over 6% was illegal in the state. Uh, I had no idea. Yeah. So that law changed in 2004. And then, of course, we're the beer geeks like us are just mm-hmm. sitting around waiting for something to happen. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Brickstore Pub, like, jumped on it in Decatur and, like, yeah. you know, it was like a rocket off to the moon. Yeah. And, and everyone in Athens is kind of like, meh. You know, yeah. they're still and drinking the, and, their PBR. Yeah. And to be clear, the model was already built because in the rest of the country, there are these pubs for now for 20 years. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I know RFD was one in D.C. where I live that has been exploring. It was Belgian. It was all these things that they've had. And you could just tell by how old the bar is. They've been doing it for a long time. So it was ready to go. It was just someone needed the push here in Georgia. That's right. That's right. And so, you know, I, I, I went ahead and, and did that. And my attitude with trapeze was I didn't actually give any f- about what anyone wanted to drink. I just carried the things that made me happy. Love it. Um, and, you know, I had a full-time job, so I didn't have to actually make money doing it, which, you know, was a, a nice yeah, that always luxury. Helps. That always helps. Um, so, and uh, let me jump into a little personal experience story here. As Nick said, um, I started in the beer industry before I worked at 680 The Fan and Extra 1063. Um, but when I, not only before I started on the supplier side of the industry, but just when I was serving tables and, and bartending in Decatur in Atlanta, actually right. at the sister restaurant, the Brickstore Pub, and we would go up to Athens for this, that, or whatever. Trapeze is, was, but it's certainly when you owned it, such a wonderful bar, and I had so many good memories there. And then when I got on the supplier side of things, I did a lot of events, and the staff was incredible. So it wasn't yeah. just a selection of beer. It was great food. It was a warm environment. It had definitely had a ha- – well, it's been since renovated a little bit. I mean, it was a little bit cleaner and shinier and all this stuff, but it had a very yeah. European feel, and you could always Love get – it was. I mean, it was. It was the only thing in Athens, absolutely, especially at the time, that you could drink really good beer in the proper glassware, and whether it's Chimay or Duval, Duval or Orval or whatever. And this is same. before the douchebags yeah. came about that pretended like they knew everything and were stuffy with it. it. This well, is when it this, was a there was three. Almost. There was probably three. Entirely. Yeah, it was a counterculture. It, so, oh, it was absolutely counterculture. There was maybe three breweries in Georgia at the time. Four. We have an hour. Right. I mean, we have a minute and fifteen left. So let's look, put on the marketing hat. Why did you come up with the name? And what did it take to get that place going? Was it just to take off like a rocket ship, or did it take marketing and and the ground game to get it going? You know, trapeze. Yeah. Um, yeah, so trapeze, it has two Ps, and it was kind of a nod to the Trappist. Trap, Belgian style, Yeah, the yeah. Belgian Trappist monks who, who, you know, I think they make some of the best beer in the world. Um, yeah, and, and you know what? Our marketing style kind of was that that kind of organic word of mouth. We're going to keep this, like, quiet and underground. Um, and yeah, counterculture again. I- indeed, indeed. And um, and I think that that's why it it, it really thrived. We weren't, we weren't, you know, buying billboards, yeah. almost no print advertising. If we bought... Print advertising was basically just doing a favor for a friend who had a magazine or something yeah. like that. And you know what I love? Like those stories are told and you can't do it these days because what happens is right. someone comes in with the intent to do that. And when you intend to make counterculture, yeah, you make it's garbage fake. Well, and, and, it's, and it's fake. That's and, right. And it's people, disingenuous and people, know, people can are so smell that. Much, yeah. They can smell it nowadays. Right. It's a different world. They are used to they, – there's so much – they know what's fake and they know what's real. So uh, well, I actually have a question, a part of the – and I've never – Let's hold off. Let's go, okay. let's go to the break. Fine. When we're back from break, we'll have Tyler open up the show as soon as we get back from the break. You've been listening to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3. A lifetime of hard work. Children laughing in the kitchen. Family photos on a restaurant wall. A legacy that lives on. It all comes from the power of a conversation. Like the one Tommy Hall had with First Horizon Bank about taking over his father's Charleston-based restaurant business. Now the table is set for a whole new generation. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Tommy. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3. Nick Constantino here, and I am sitting in with guest host for today, Tyler Nelson. Hello. And Eric Johnson of Wild Heaven. And before the break, I rudely cut Tyler off, as I should. I'm his boss. Man, but we'll let Tyler hop right back on here. Of course, ahead, I'm used to it. Well, so as Nick mentioned in the first half of the break, if you're just not joining us, is that I before I worked at the before I worked in radio, I was in the craft beer industry and known Eric for a very long time. And um, the brewery I worked for had a very different marketing approach in terms of packaging. And I remember this one time I brought the owner of the brewery visiting from California to Wild Heaven, and y'all met him, and he was a big fan of y'all's and vice versa and all this. Except the first thing he said to me when we got in the car is, "Man, I I don't like their packaging." And ours, the brewery that I work for that I won't call out at the, at the moment, uh, who's had a lot of problems in the past several years and sold out and all this other stuff, had w- their, the packaging ethos was the same package, different color. Right. For the, for the, so it had this billboard effect if they were in, in, the cold, in the cold box at the store that you saw it, right? That was his idea was that you would see it and there were just different colors per different beer. Wild Heaven 
each can, each beer has its own identity and it's like a piece of art almost and it's its own like feeling. It, but I, like, I, I love the Wild Heaven packaging. So it's not that he didn't have a point with what the billboard effect was. It's just that it, it didn't ever feel like it had a soul to me, whereas Wild Heaven's marketing element of how it's presented does. So was that intentional or t- just talk about that to me, I guess. You know, we kind of follow the old model that, that was similar to what you're describing um, in the early, early days of Wild Heaven. And, and frankly, when, when I was awakened to the power of, of marketing with the package was when we put out emergency drinking beer. And, mm-hmm. and, and I can't take any credit for that idea. That was Alvin Desch um, and working with the guys at Victory Sandwich Bar. Um, and it was this kind of interesting-ish yellow beer that we were making to – to be like the, whatever, the Coors or Miller for right. for that venue. Almost as a F.U. joke kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And so... If you have to drink it, if you have nothing else. Yeah. In case, pull rip cord Emergency beer. drink beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, And right. it's packaged like, the, like, like just beer, like emergency, like emergency drink, drinking, water. drinking water that yeah. you are rationing you would get in, yeah. in, in Army or Navy or whatever else, right? Yeah, and so what, and, and, a, and the beer really blew up in a way that I I never anticipated. It, it, it seemed like it was just too gimmicky and not interesting enough, but... But what happened was that that and for the listeners, that's a it's a Pilsner style beer with Himalayan pink sea salt, right? It, it, right, it's got sea salt and lemongrass. In lemongrass, it. yeah, it's freaking but, delicious. Yeah, it's it's great, it's great. Um, but from from fifty feet across a bar, you can see that can. Yeah. yeah. And at that point in time, to my knowledge, there were no yellow cans, and, and especially something that was this stark. It, the the art's almost ugly. It's really austere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I realized is that. The, the beer itself is not in its own right interesting enough to sell that package. People were responding to the art on the can. Yeah. And, when, and when you're only doing like this is the red banded one, the yellow banded one, the whatever, there are many problems with that. If you make 80 beers a year, then, then what, what are you dipping into like – teal or something you know like <laughs> how does it even you, you, how sustainable we have gotten rid of all the primary colors <laughs> yeah. you gotta start making up your own colors it's like do you want the champagne one or the teal one i don't know the difference between those two um but it, it costs the same amount of money to print something that is beautiful and interesting as it does to print something that's boring it, right. they, they don't charge you any more money for good art but you got to have the balance because there are right. plenty of people who make bad beer and put it in fancy cans, and there are plenty of people who put good beer in bad cans. I mean, it is a it is a balancing because I remember so when yes. I was living the in liquid DC, matters. The, the liquid, liquid matters. matters. So when right. I was in DC, um, I got to really know the guys from Flying Dog uh, mm-hmm. up in Frederick, and they every can was the the guy who did, drew for Hunter S. Thompson. Mm-hmm. Every can right. was drawn like the most elaborate thing you've ever seen. Right? It was it was pretty good beer, but I got to know those guys. That that the allure of the cans sold a lot of that beer. A lot of that beer. Now this was 2008. Yeah. I mean, this is no, probably ago, 2010. Yeah. This is a long time ago. This was early in the phase of it. Um, but I do remember those cans stood out. To be honest with you, more than the taste. Well, of the and beer I think well, Eric, yeah. what you're saying yeah, is yeah. that in a certain sense is that there's a lot of ways that a consumer decides on a buy. Those a couple of ways a consumer drinks that beer before they ever taste it, That's right? right? And if the liquid's good, they come back to it. But if it Right price, looks cool, makes me feel a certain way. Okay, I'll try it. And then if it's good, okay, I'll, I'll drink it again, right? Absolutely, yeah. And, and the, especially in a crowded market where, you know, when, when we opened Wild Heaven, it was, I think we were like the fifth or sixth brewery in Georgia. But, but in that, that early group, you know, that, the group of breweries, it was right after, um, you know, Atlanta Brewing, Sweetwater, and Terrapin. Um, there was like y'all Monday night in jailhouse, and that's all I can think of. Yeah, there, there were very few. Yeah. There were very few. And so, you know, we all had a lot of shelf space, and it was, it was, it was easy-ish to stand out. Yeah. Um, but as things got more and more and more crowded, you could, you could see the problem with just the color banding and very generic kind of art. Because the, the, more, the more crowded a market is, the harder and harder it is to get someone to try it once. And to your point mm-hmm. about the, the, the liquid needing to be quality, that is very, very important because then they won't buy it twice. Of and if you if you can get both of those right, then that's that really is the recipe for a winner. I, I think that there's there's nothing that demonstrates that better than the success of Tropicalia. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful art. It's also art that tilts feminine, which I think is important. Um, a lot of a lot of our art is very deliberately designed um, to tilt more feminine than masculine. A lot of what exists in the world of craft beer art is so masculine that it it, it it's flying all, dog being a great example. Well, flying <laughs> dog's a great example, right? 
um, yeah, yeah, I don't imagine in, a, much, a ton of chicks watching Fear the, and Loathing in Las yeah, yeah, Vegas yeah. and walking away. Yeah, I get it. But, you know, if, if, the, if the industry is going to grow, we have to figure out how to not alienate women and then dudes who aren't white. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. th- those are it, those are categories I think are, are which, in- it, which is a observational comment. If you've been to a craft brewery, any yeah. of them, you it's, have seen exactly. Yeah. Who it's the really, bro. It's We're not really white. Thing. It's white yeah. dudes. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And yeah. uh, just because I really like sound effects, I'm going to give one. That's the sound of Tyler destroying my whole show by starting this segment with something we completely were not talking about. But we've come back full circle. So let's come back. So we, we open Wild Heaven at a I'm time. I'm a market where, disruptor. We, were, we opened Wild Heaven at a time where there are not a lot. So talk about the first location, then talk about how we've slowly started building other ones and where you see opportunities and sure. either markets or collaborations. Because one of the things I think you guys do better than anyone else is spot those opportunities for collaboration and work on them, but commit enough to them that they work. Because a lot of people have big eyes for collaborations, but don't know what it takes to invest to make those collaborations work so talk about from that initial stage of one brewery to where we are today yeah so when when we opened the original brewery in avondale so many of the brands that exist at that point in time they they would have four or five you know flagship beers and then that's that's all they made um you look at especially like the iconic belgian breweries you know chimay has three products that's what mm-hmm. they make and they've I, always, I was fascinated mm-hmm. when I went to Germany, to Munich, to the Hopra House. Like, you think that they have all this beer. There are three beers, yeah. and everyone's only drinking one of those three. They're That's drinking right. the regular beer. There's a light, a dark, and a heavy, and that is all they have in the entire beer house in Munich, and everyone's drinking the light. So it's crazy to think that you have to have so many beers to be successful because you don't. But go on, Well, sorry. and our, our, our market was driven so much by the wholesalers because until 2017, we had one customer. It was illegal for me to sell you a pint of beer, right. and think about that. Right. And so, in a state where you can't transfer dis- distributors yeah. when you want to, like, yeah. we're very familiar with oh, those awful, awful rules. But, yeah. but that being said, you need the distributor to get to the next level. You can't just. Well, it was, your, it was the only customer. To right. his point is that you not only couldn't sell a pint of beer at the brewery, you sold a ten dollar ticket for a tour, and the beer was free, and you couldn't sell. You couldn't take a six pack with you when you left. So, it, unless yeah. you were cool. <laughs> Unless yeah, someone we wasn't were, watching as you are. <laughs> yeah, we, we were we were very limited by just the number of SKUs that a wholesaler would would pick up. And so that's why we weren't making 30, 40, 50, 60 beers a year. Um, and because we only had one customer, really, um, you weren't making small tanks of anything. You had to get into the volume game as fast as you conceivably could. Um, and, and, and that's coming... You know that that's that's starting to bite you know medium sized breweries in the ass hard. If you're if you're still really 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 your if your business model is devoted principally to distribution, um, you know inflation is is you know it's the walls are closing in. Yeah. Um, and and so moving forward, when, especially when SB eighty five passed in twenty seventeen, it was <laughs> really and that really, was a law that allowed brewer- breweries to sell direct to consumer at on site. That's right. right. That's still right. within limitations. There are still limitations. It's still yeah. not as easy as a lot of the states. One case but per there's... person per day. We can't sell any kegs, um, but we can sell pints over the counter. And and that was really, it, it was an imperative. Had that law not changed, you know, we've seen a few craft breweries have gone under this year, but if that law had not changed, um, you would have easily lost over half of the Georgia breweries because, you know, just the price of Hops and malt and, and packaging and labor, you know? We used- I, I think George is pretty good at seeing the writing on the wall. And what they started to see was there was this uh, craft beer tourism where people would actually go to cities just to go try. Like Asheville is a great example. You'd be able to show up in Asheville and just bar hop all through Asheville. Yeah. That's business you're losing on to a city that's two and a half hours away from here if you are not smart with it. And similarly with gambling and, and now marijuana, you see all it's these why the, It's why the federal right. government overturned prohibition. It's not because they wanted to drink. It's because of the tax revenue. They needed it. Yeah, after it's the because great all the bootlegs. Like mm-hmm. We're doing better right. jobs selling it and not making any tax revenue off of it. So that's why they exactly. bring it back. Like everything we've ever done, we've banned things and then we realize that the tax revenue is there and we bring them all right back right away. <laughs> uh, but we've completely distracted from the point. So <laughs> so you're growing. So talk about those collaborations and how you realize you had to expand strategically to get to the point you are today. Yeah. And so a lot of that was born out of um, being able to finally spread our wings and start making smaller batches of beer. When you look at all the breweries that have opened in Georgia post-2017, what we were missing in Georgia, you know, prior to 2017, maybe there were 40-ish breweries. Now, I don't know how many there are, probably uh, 150 100. or who even knows. I don't like even know. Every abandoned gas station has one in it now. A lot, um, a lot of people come and ask me, like, oh, hey, have you heard of this? I'm like, mm, I haven't even heard of no, them. No, I haven't tried even, it. Haven't can't even keep up with them. Yeah. So we, we, because we're able to now do like a five-barrel batch of beer or seven-barrel batch of beer where we're only making 30 cases and a few kegs, um, 
we can now go explore, you know, the the limits of, of what, you know, of what can be made um, and work with ingredients that are really, really risky. I mean, we end up along the way making some stuff that's that's brilliant and some stuff that we end up dumping. You Borderline know? poison. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. see, Ricky he is a microbiologist. Like, He's not dead. Actually, in government that. warning, do not consume <laughs> this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there, there's, there, yeah there, there's a lot of beer out there that I would say is borderline poison. Yeah. Um, and for, for us, um, you know, it, 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 it allowed me to tap into the, the culinary side of beer. Beer sure. is, is culinary. Yeah. Wine is agricultural. Spirits are production manufacturing. There is no excuse to ever make a boring beer. You're not limited by any ingredients that you can use. There, there are literally hundreds of thousands of ingredients that you can use. And when you make something that's uninspired, that's on you. You, you need to not put that into market. And so we started tapping into, instead of doing like brewery on brewery collaborations, and we've done some of those, um, but those are kind of like, you know, hey, what do you like to work with? What do I like to work with? Let's put them together. Yeah. And, and it's hard to find mutual interest, right? If you're going with somebody else, what is the agenda of this? There's always an, an, an as opposed to being experimental and really experimenting, you're trying to accomplish something together. Well, the Wild Heaven yeah. collaboration with 6 the fan aside, I think the the one that was really inspired creatively in two great brands was the one you did with Stuckey's. That was really, really cool. Right, right. The, the, the pecan log brown. Or what, what was the official name of it? Um, yeah, it was it was the pecan log brown ale. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so I didn't yeah, right. But it was. But I mean, you took you take a heritage brand like that that's seeing a resurgence in Stephanie's efforts and with a craft brewery like it. It's not brewery on brewery. It was it was a really cool one. So yeah. Yeah, to next point that is. Yeah, and then then like working with chefs, I I love doing collaboration beers with chefs because they're. The way they think about ingredients is radically different than the way that we think about ingredients. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite. And you can't adjust on the fly. So one thing about cooking, like you can alter. If you have sweet, there's a way to put some sour in. If you're too spicy, you can put some. You can't do that with beer. You Once can. You, you can. Please explain yeah, that. Yeah. I, I so so a, a lot of people don't. Secondary fermentation. Is that when? How well, would you go about this? What part in the process would you adjust the recipe somehow? So it's 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 a it's part of the process of learning how to actually work with adjunct ingredients, and what I mean by that is that if you just add everything to the kettle or everything to the fermenter and you hope it's going to turn out, um, you are doing a disservice to your customer. You can work harder than that and you can do better than that. I work with like a pint of what would be or a liter of like the the beer that we have in tank. Let's say it's a saison, and if I'm going to use fennel pollen in it. Um, I will figure out how much fennel pollen is appropriate for one pint of beer and then go do that in the tank so that 99.9% of the time it's actually correct Um, instead of just being like, well, let's put 20 gallons of pomegranate juice and then hope that that's enough (laughs) and then you're like, well, that was too much. A little pomegranate. <laughs> yeah. So you can adjust um, on the fly. So you can absolutely. Not, once it's in it, once it's in it, you cannot. You're, you're not over. You can pull stuff out. You're so you're doing math at that point. You're That's saying right. this sixteenth is equivalent to this two thousand liters. Yeah, it's like how many we, micrograms of of lemongrass, ex, you know, that we've extracted in like you know a pure grain alcohol, or you know, there there are, there are ways of of working with almost any ingredient. Um, to get the exact result yeah. that you, I have that to imagine want. that that has you have a quite a elevated palate to be able to differentiate those things because I don't know sure. what fennel pollen tastes like. Uh, I'm willing to no, try. I'm Italian. Like, fennel yeah. pretty much runs through my blood, but <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm curious. Like, d- did you actively have to make your palate be able to pick these things up, or was that something that was part of this process and innate to you? Well, no. I've, I've spent a lot of time with palate training. Okay. Um, every human can elevate the performance Sounds of their somewhat palate. sexual somehow, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, it does. Wow. Um, but, you know, learning how to how to taste the... Say I mean, the he's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> learning how to taste like the, the, the unintended flavors in beer, the off flavors, things that you don't want, whether it's diacetyl, acetylaldehyde, you know, many, many things that, that are indicative of poor fermentations. And, and actually many of those compounds will make you very, very sick. Um, outside of that, also... Knowing the difference between, like, okay, citrus. Well, that's very generic. What kind of citrus are you sure. talking about? Are you talking about a kumquat, a lemon? Are you talking about a sure. white grapefruit? Are you talking about an overripe pink grapefruit? Um, Even the city of a fruit changes. I mean, you can have something that's, that's right. super, that the sour all of a sudden becomes super grapes are a great example. The longer they sit, the sweeter they actually become. It's changing. The, the makeup of it hasn't changed. Just the way the sugars break down changes in real time pretty much. That's right. And, and also when we, th- when we think about whatever, let's peaches. You know, that's a very, that's a very generic, yep. you know, modifier. Is it a cooked peach? Is it a fresh peach? Is it a white peach? What kind is it a of freaking nectarine? That's I right. Mean, who, people don't even know the difference when they're laying. That's out right. There. Yeah. And so the the way to 
the, the way to think about training your palate, there, there are many, many different things that you can buy that, you know, different essences that you can, you know, smell and learn. Okay, well, that's how that expresses. But the, the, the most simple thing that we can all do is whenever you are drinking, drink with intentionality, be thoughtful about it. And for, for me, it's very, it'd be very unusual that I would just, just pound a beer. Yeah. Um, it, and, and the same way that like a chef is evaluating the food that yeah. they made, when you drink that beer, take thoughtful sips and think about like, okay, what, there's a nuttiness here. What is that yes. nuttiness? Is it almond? Is it pecan? Is it walnut? Is it cashew? And and get specific about it and challenge yourself to to actually drink thoughtfully. You will enjoy the products that you, whatever you drink, you're going to enjoy it more. Yeah. Or you'll learn that, you know what, that's not enjoyable and stop after the, sec, the second sip. Yeah. I love what you said. Two parts. One, that shows that the palate is like any other muscle. You have to train it and you have to go be deliberate with how you go about mm-hmm. things. Um, my question is, how do you not be a douchebag while you do that? Because when you're out and you're like, pinky up and you're like, hey, 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 look at the mouth feel. <laughs> like, how do you, because, and I, and I Just joke. Just don't twist your mustache so, with wax so, while look, you do it. And, you're fine. and I joke, but one of the things I always try to do is one of the first things I was taught and probably by reading reviews is different parts of your mouth taste things differently, right? right. The front of your right. tongue, the back of your tongue, throw all these different feels. But how do you, like, it's gotten to the point now when you see people doing that and they're spitting out their wine, it's like, ugh, look at this douchebag. How do you do that? Why, why do you do that? Tell to everyday people why it's important to be deliberate with this stuff and why if you really want to spend money, spend money on something that's worth it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it goes back to what we are talking about with, with just allowing the beverage to be an experience. Um, and... I mean, I, I think the best way to do it without being a douchebag is just to do it, just to do it quietly. Yeah. Also, with beer, if you're spitting beer, um, you're doing bitter, it wrong. <laughs> bitterness is detected in the back of the yep. of the tongue, and so if you're spitting it, you're not actually experiencing one of the most important flavor profiles. And then it's just a matter of being consistent. And and I mean, I think that for some people, it's like scratching down little notes. Um, you know, for other folks, you know, they they have the ability to really recall with a high degree of detail. Um, I mean, one thing I would say about palates too, that's, that is just true is that the lion's share of all the best palates, for example, many people are born with just way more taste buds yep. per, you know, yep. square centimeter. Yep. Um, the, they're females. Women have way better palates than men. Yep. They just do. If we're going to be stereotypical and, and cast a, a broad net, and that's where I love like, a chick with a trained palate. Yeah. There you go. Well, when when she's when she's telling you oh, that Lord. it's bad, or when she's telling you that it's too bitter or too hoppy, yeah. there's a reason she's she's not those wrong. Up. Yeah, she's right. not wrong. It probably means that that you need to smoke fewer cigarettes, stop eating all the really hot Thai food. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. you got to take care of your palate. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I'm pretty much a uh, ghost pepper regular. I don't know how I taste anything these days. <laughs> uh, but you know, so this has been what I really love here is we're talking. We've gone from every part of this to how you're picking real estate to packaging to how how much. Th- thought has to go into this. So you've said a lot to these, but how do you market that? So we're talking about Wild Heaven. A lot of people know, a lot of people know from emergency drinking beer. A lot of people know from being to a brewery. It is- Or just y'all been around longer. But but Mm -hmm. who you're going, knowing your audience and who you go after. So the audience who's coming to try an experimental beer is different than someone who's picking up uh, emergency drinking beer at a Kroger. Those are very different people. Exactly. So talk about how you know who your audience is and how you market to them as you expand and grow from your, the new, the new one in Brookhaven, in um, Toco Hills. As you expand- how do you market it, and how is it different per each kind of clientele? Yeah, and I mean, I would say one of the most important changes um, since 2017 is the fact that we can now interact directly with the customer in a way that we never could. And and the storytelling behind what we're doing creatively is is super, super important. And there are many tools that when we open Wild Heaven, I don't think things like Instagram were really a thing. Um, I mean, we no. certainly <laughs> weren't doing anything in that space. And, yeah. And um, so we've got all these new avenues where we can actually communicate direct to consumers. Here's why you should you should give any shits about this. I think that there's um, there are a lot of brands out there that are making really, really interesting and inspired beer. And there's many, many brands out there that are not. Yeah. And so we're going to cover that next segment, by the way. Keep going. But our ne- I, I've changed our next minute. Now it's going to be right. how to know what to look out for when you're at a bad brewery. We're there you go. That's what we're going to do. Keep <laughs> going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that I think that for for us, it's like leaning into our strengths and leaning into the things that that we really value when it comes to to creativity, which is the culinary aspects of beer, the botanical aspects of beer. So many of those collaborations, like Garden Beer with Atlanta Botanical Gardens. Um, it is a great way for us to, on an ongoing basis, tell the story 
about what is different about the way that Wild Heaven approaches the creative process. Yeah. And doing Chef Beer and, you know, and, and doing those collaborations with, you know, well-known Atlanta chefs where we were highlighting what the flavors they're working with. And then, you know, showing people that like, uh, yeah, you can make a beer with sumac and star anise that is really, really delicious. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. beer does great with food. It does great with food. Yeah. Um, and those are those are advanced. Like so, sumac and star anise. One probably from different cuisines. I think star anise. I think pho. I think Vietnamese. Uh, sumac. I think Mediterranean, Lebanese, sure. Moroccan, which yeah. don't usually go together. But if you think about the the spice palette, they actually really do go together. I don't right, know. Right? What, what's this? What style of beer did was that in? It was an amber saison, and it was a it was a beer that I made with Shy Levy from okay. uh, Third Space. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I did, love it. I love it, dude. Where, yeah, I think ultimately the best part about all this is, is as you talk through these things, one, it's a lot like cooking. So if you like food, you probably haven't given beer enough time to understand all of those nuances, right? It's really it is an amazing thing to be able to sit and like one of my favorite things to do on a Sunday is look in the fridge, see what the hell I have, and then make whatever I have out of that. And like soups lend themselves mm-hmm. work. You throw everything in a freaking pot, boil <laughs> yeah. it, and as yeah. long as you use it the right way um and i think it, it's it's what it's sounding like is people get complacent when they brew and they get a that winner and they just double down on that winner as opposed to being experimental but you also have to be deliberate in a gear experiments what is the end goal in mind right right and and, and look I, I think too that there's a difference between brewers that want to lead and brewers that want to follow um i don't really give two shits about your version of bell sue hearted bell sue hearted already exists it's right. a damn good beer and we don't need your brand's version of it Go create something that deserves to sit on a shelf and create something that's thoughtful and create something that is unique to you. And through that process, then I can then connect with your personality. I can then connect with your creativity. It's like peering into your soul through beer. Right into the <laughs> eyes of your soul. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think of that note, we'll be right back. You've been listening to Marketing Man Man on Extra 106.3. This morning in North Carolina, wheels are spinning. Determination is winning. A passion is now a thriving business, and it shows no signs of slowing down. How? The power of a conversation, like the one Clint Spiegel had with First Horizon Bank about starting a bike wheel manufacturing facility in Asheville. Now it's not just talk, it's rubber meets road. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Clint. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men. Uh, we've had a fascinating conversation. Honestly, it's been awesome. Um, so most importantly, how do people find Wild Heaven? Everywhere. Give us the locations. Give us the social handles. Give us every way that they can find and engage with you guys. Yeah, so our, our first location uh, is in Avondale Estates, um, 135B Maple Street. And uh, then our second location is in West End, 1010 White Street. Um, and so there's we're tucked into a, a group of, there's Monday Night Garage over there. The Lee and Murray, White. Lee and White mm-hmm. Development, right? Um, American Spirit Works has a location. So it's a yeah. really nice little bit of, of beverage tourism happening over there. Um, we have also broken ground on a Toco Hills location. Yep. That we hope to have open sometime in the first quarter of next that year. That area needed it, man. That is a densely populated. I used to live a couple blocks. Yeah, that is I a densely that populated area, area mm-hmm. that is just starting to catch their whiff of the city moving its way up. How so will that location be different than other, than the other two locations? Um, so we're doing we're doing a, a food collaboration with Fox Brothers Barbecue there, and so we'll have a, a small three barrel system. Our head brewer Josh Franks is going to be um, taking the helm of that one. He's been with us now for I want to say almost seven years. Um, and is a hell of a great brewer, and uh, so he's earned his wings. He's mm-hmm. getting his own brewery, and so that'll be that's pretty cool, super man. That, that's a nice thing because now you're you, you're bringing people up through the system, also, which I, I absolutely love. That's like a chef, yeah. right? Your your sous chefs always become head chefs and executive chefs, and they share the knowledge and they blend. I love that, and we want them to be better than us. Like I, I you know, Josh is is insanely talented, and giving him the freedom to to go explore. That's great. That's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun to see what he does. So, uh, last question I had for you. I think we, Nick has one more segment to get into, but I remember the moment that I fell in love with beer that ended in being a multi, almost a whole decade of a career for me. Uh, I was standing up at the Belgian bar at the Brick Store in Decatur with uh, my father, one of the owners of the Brick Store, and a guy from Belgium who worked at a brewery over there. Um, and we were doing a vertical of Orval, which is a Trappist beer that the only beer they make, they make one beer and it's fan freaking tastic. And we were doing vertical, meaning different ages uh, in the right. linear years, right? 
and it was this incredible conversation. I didn't know this guy from Adam. He's half the world away. He speaks five languages. I barely speak one. And but we're able to commune over beer. And I was like, definitely twenty one. And but it was <laughs> phenomenal. It was the sharing of cultures and, and communing over this. And that's when I, when I fell in love with it. What was your if there is one Genesis moment or one origin story or one sure. beer that really set it off for you? What is that beer? What was that story? Something like that. Yeah, I think I think the moment in which I realized that beer could be more than a delivery system for alcohol. Right. Um, I was probably 17 or 18, and somebody handed me a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, and it was just a game changer. It was like yeah. even even today, that's one of my I think that, all time too, that yeah. beer still holds up yeah. even yeah. to this day. And and it was mind blowing because it had this like assertive grapefruit and and actually a malt backbone mm-hmm. and. And that was the beginning of the end for me. It like changed everything where it was like, yeah, I'm done drinking yellow beer. There is nothing more snobby and self-righteous than a beer aware, not even 21 year old. That's for damn sure. (laughs) I'm I'm glad that you guys, I'm glad that you guys asked me, but luckily it's my show. So I'm going to give mine, mine here. (laughs) There you go. Uh, Mine was actually at Busch Gardens and I was about 16 years old (laughs) and my dad was pissed at my mom. And if you remember, Anheuser-Busch used to own Busch Gardens. Mm -hmm. So my dad, who deliberately lambasted me for having a fake ID when I was that age, looks at me and goes, you still got that ID? And we walked <laughs> over to their trial, and they had free trials of everything. And I went to go get, because you're now I'm a 16-year-old. I'm like, oh, do they have Bush Light? Like, and he's like, no, they, we were drinking like Red Dog and Red Wolf and all these other mm-hmm. international breweries. And I'm drinking them. My dad's like slapping me on the hand. Like, you don't, that's not why you drink beer, to chug the beer. And he made me sip all of them. And bonding with my dad, who doesn't even really drink. I think he was just pissed off at the moment. Um, but trying international beers all one place and realizing how different everything tastes, I think that was the point where I was like, Oh, I guess just shotgunning MGDs is not the answer. Yeah, bring bring right. a father to a theme park. He's going to want to drink. That's <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, luckily, every time I go to a dream park, I do theme park, I do that and other things. Um, but anyway, so let's end. Let's In, in closing, we've got about five minutes left. So, hypothetical scenario. I am dropped in a city I've never been to. Call it I'm on business. I'm out on a Saturday night. Right. I want to go try and do some beer tourism. Uh-huh. Okay? What do I look for of places to go visit and what not to visit? And what do I do when I get in there? I have a sip and it's awful. What do I know so I should just get up and leave? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, um, I'll answer your last question first, that, that if you ever take a sip of anything that doesn't make you happy, you should stop drinking it immediately. Um, there, there are so many fascinating, fascinating and amazing beers out there. Um, and it, it may be that a brewery made a beer that was like really experimental, and it may be a good example of that style, and it might be that you just don't like that. Sure. There are beers that I've made where people will tell me, like, that's literally one of the worst beers I've ever had. And, and I always just laugh and tell them that I didn't make that for you. Yeah. You know? And yeah. so sometimes or, 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 or people <laughs> review an IPA yeah, online, be, like, terrible, well, but I don't like IPAs. A Belgian, right, right, tri- right. a Belgian triple is off putting if you've only drank Pilsner's your whole life. That's right. right? The that's banana right. Yeah. in the Belgian beers is yeah. not something an American yeah. palate is used to tasting. So And it's gold, sure. so it looks like it should be live, but it has a huge for body. Sure. And yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and I would say, from a standpoint of, of, of evaluating whether or not a brewery's worth like spending the afternoon there and, and going deep into their portfolio. It's like we said earlier, start with the smallest thing that they make. If it's a golden ale, if it's a Pilsner, um, you know, because like I said, a, a brewery that can, that can brew a damn good What do you mean by small? Longer? Because that's not the word. Yeah, I, that's I not the adjective I would use. Like I would say, like I always say that same thing. I, if I walk into a brewery and I go for something old school, classic or basic, if, if it's not a Pilsner, then something straightforward like a, even a Saison or a Brown or Amber. Yeah, but and, and, Pilsner for me, but what do you mean by small? Yeah, I, I just mean... Because small can mean small batch. Like this is the one of the Fruit Loops. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean from a, from a flavor impact standpoint. So it is very, very easy to hide behind giant flavors. Yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, if, if if you fuck up a double IPA, you were sleeping through that batch. Yeah. Right. You know? Right. And, and the same thing with, like, these big, you know, stouts and, and you know, if you're going to put hundreds Burn of pounds age, of whatever, raspberry or yeah. something. Yeah. So, you know, th- those beers, you would you would expect them to literally taste like whatever, you know, is mm-hmm. on the tap handle. And it's um, almost a cover-up, too, right? That's the problem. That's right. You can right. use those things to cover up and mend the, the weaknesses and the impurities in the beer. Right, absolutely. And so, you know, just start with, with whatever beer you think would have the, the, the lowest flavor impact. Mm-hmm. If that beer is exceptional, or even if it's just a, a great example of that style, probably everything else that they have on tap is going to be delicious. And I think that there are... I, I don't encounter many breweries where there's like, oh, there's that one beer they make that I like. That's right, not the case. Right, right. There are breweries that are really, really good at beer making and that understand fermentation and understand the culinary aspects of recipe 
creation. What percentage of them do you think, if you had to guess, in oh, this country man, are making beer? I don't know. Uh, right that's... away. Yeah, so <laughs> a quarter I'll, I'll at most. Honest, I'm going to probably bet that if yeah. you look at an individual town, it's probably a third. But I bet you if you look holistically overall, it's probably less than uh, It that. depends on the town, too. I mean, because like even different geographies are going to have different, like what the populist gravitates towards because if you go to San Diego which is a town but that doesn't mean that you the size of this town have breweries that are making beer right but the right way that cult that group of that area of the country might drink certain things more or right here I'm saying more the beer the ones that are blatantly a cash grab where they they trying to capitalize on a trend they probably have no intention of holding it for much longer they want to flip it like that is so rampant if you go to a brewery and there's no dogs leave (laughs) I mean I, I, I think that I think that to your point there's there are a lot of enthusiasts you know, I, I say that there's there's too many breweries right now that are the product of a home brewer with a rich uncle. Yeah. And it, and they're not approaching it from a standpoint of we want to make the best beer in the world. Now, they, you know, we, I'm not saying at Walt Heaven that we, we accomplish that sure. all the time. But you got to dream big, but man. But that is Why our goal. Why do it if not? Why not try to be the best if you're going to do something? That's right. Our well, goal to Eric's is, point, I, I won't say who or what brewery, but a home brewer who was the best home brewer. I've, I mean, incredible, incredible beer. And they opened a brewery and it was... Yeah. That's why most uh, mm-hmm. most most professional f- players don't make good coaches. I mean, it, it happens. It's not it's not, it's not unsurprising. Most salespeople don't make good managers. I mean, this is not a new trend in anything. Yeah, yeah. And, and, said and, that. you know, Probably. making making a five gallon batch of something at your at your house. You know, there's pretty much anyone can do that. Hold you it. also have an affinity to your own products. If you make your own beer, you're gonna like yeah. it. Like I didn't even let someone have my beer because first of all, I was like, oh, this is the best thing in the world because in your head, you're gonna automatically gravitate to something you've made. Well, what happens when other people have to and, drink but, it? But also when when you share it. With with your friends and they've had four or five of your beers and they're already a little drunk, they're not going to be objective about how bad it actually is sometimes. <laughs> so you don't always get the best feedback. That was my only advice when I was a personal <laughs> chef for a little while. I was like, guys, get drunk. The food tastes better. Mm-hmm. And on that note, uh, Eric, thank you very much. Tyler, thank you for being here. You've been to the Marketing Thanks. Mammon on Extra 106.3 and we'll catch you next time. A lifetime of hard work. Children laughing in the kitchen. Family photos on a restaurant wall. A legacy that lives on. It all comes from the power of a conversation, like the one Tommy Hall had with First Horizon Bank about taking over his father's Charleston-based restaurant business. Now the table is set for a whole new generation. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Tommy. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC.